sur le bord du Saint-Laurent. Puis quand c'est l'amour, c'est l'amour. C'est sur le bord du Saint-Laurent. Il y avait trois jolies filles. Il y avait trois jolies filles. Il y avait trois jolies filles. Tali la 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 li la la. Puis quand c'est l'amour, c'est l'amour. Tali la 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 li la la. Tala la li la la. On the shores of the St. Lawrence, 50 miles below Quebec City, lies the village of Petite Riviere. Once it was a farming village, but the sea has washed away the fields that used to stretch green and smooth half a mile wide along the shore. Little by little, the village has become only a road and some houses at the foot of a mountain. The men of the village said, we cannot cultivate the sea, and they became sailors. Since that time, each spring, Petite Riviere rediscovers her goalettes, wearied by winds, scraped by many landings, broken by the weight of the waves and the weathering of many seas. A goalette has not a long life as a coastal freighter. After 10 years, she may begin to leak, and after 20 years, sometimes less, she must be left on the graveyard of a beach. The captain of a ship which has sailed its last voyage looks at the side of a mountain. When a captain looks at the side of a mountain, it is because he is dreaming of a fine new ship. At Petite Riviere, or Ile aux Coudes, at Saint Joseph de la Rive, or Lille d'Orléans, Sometimes on the clear winter air, there rings out an almost forgotten sound. The sound of the broad axe squaring timber to build a goalette. The flat bottom is not an advantage at sea. The captains say of their boats that they are sabots, wooden shoes. But they must have the flat bottom so that the boats can be beached for loading along the shore where there are no wharves. the snow goose floating on the river. The rib makers use wood carefully chosen for its natural curves. The carpenter architect makes a template for each rib, setting the angles and the lines for his bird of the sea. The template represents the genius of the carpenter, his idea, his picture of a boat, which the rib makers translate into wood, using the curves imposed by the mountains, the curves of the trees which grew from steep hillsides toward the sun. The smell of the fresh wood inspires the carver, and the axe rings upon the wood like music. And a workman, who is also a sailor, carves like a sculptor the shape of a new ship. solid rib, the workman must join together seven or nine overlapping pieces of wood. Then he must chisel them with an axe to reproduce the template of the carpenter.
two months, two teams of rib makers and a team of rib setters follow the patterns, assembling and carving more than a hundred ribs with no two pair alike. which centuries ago made its first roads and its houses and its church steeple with the axe, still uses the axe to build a wooden ship with an overall length of 120 feet. In summer, the wood would be more pliable and the actions of the workmen freer. But they say that the cold is the best overseer. And besides, in winter, the captain can count on the assistance of other captains to build a fine ship. set the stem piece, and another day they have raised the stern post. Now the rib makers are at work carving the false stern, which they call the aiguille, the needle. It is like the tail of a fish, responsible for the way the ship handles and the beauty of the goelette. Setting in place of the needle is a sort of grand game in which the strength of the whole team working together is needed. It is a great event because of the size of the piece and because of its importance in the ship. Each man feels that he contributes to the success of the enterprise by his part in it, watching, helping, or just assuming a share of the anxiety of the captain. For on the curve of the stern depends the stability of the boat and the manner in which she responds to the helm. Once the ribbing is finished from stem to stern, the symmetrical ribs must be joined to each other by strong beams. Their construction seems commonplace, but they must be given a curve that is exactly right for the strength of the decks and the shedding of water in high seas. Now a new force is brought to bear on the wood, the vaporous softening force of the steam box. Already shaped and beveled by the axe, the planks for the sides of the ship must now be bent to a smooth curve. The plankers must force the wood into place, making it follow the lines of the ribs. To achieve the graceful shear of the goelette, the plankers use many means. Presses, wedges, clamps, chains and screw jacks succeed each other, pulling and pushing. The sound is like a gothic cell where someone accused of sorcery yields inch by inch to the inquisition and the instruments of torture. Ah! 
and this exorcism would not succeed in bending the heavy planking without the preparatory imprisonment in the hot cell where constant steam softens the wood and destroys its resistance to the point where it submits to the demands of the ribs. <laughs> Before it is steamed, each plank is trimmed by the axe and beveled by the plane. For more than two months, the workmen have followed the bevel square of the carpenter and shaped the planks one by one, each different from all the rest. Meanwhile, a man with an adze makes a tour of the ship, smoothing the ribs to prepare for the planking, as though, in its turn, the planking were imposing its form on the ribs. One fine day, a silent man arrives from his island. He is the corker. The whole ship is his for the caulking. He works at it seam by seam, day by day, with patience and rapt attention. Into every seam he puts four rolls of oakum. Finally, the skeleton is completed, the form obtained. The plankers continue almost mechanically to put on the covering of the skeleton. Now the forest yields its very roots. The workmen cut these knees from the strongest part of the tree, the merging of root into trunk. Each beam is joined with rigid ingrained strength to the next beam and to the adjoining ribs by a series of root curves. Cross bracing in all directions gives a unity to all the strengths. of solidity to the hull, and all its elements will withstand the buffeting of heavy seas and gales. is carried on, combining strength with form at every stage. Now those who have softened so many planks in the steam box must find a new means of forcing the last plank into place and putting the seal on the work of the planking. surprise themselves when they realize that all the effort, all the strokes of the axe and adze and hammer 
have become the hull of a fine ship, ready for the winds and waves of the Gulf. The superstructure seems to build itself, a mere result of the form chosen by the carpenter and followed by the workman. The axe and the bevel square lose their importance, and these builders of goalettes become simple carpenters. The men who have built the ship are almost all sailors, except one who is the village blacksmith. Perhaps it is because they are seamen that they are so anxious that the newest ship should be the most beautiful. It is admirable that they consent to take orders from a carpenter, for most of them are captains or second mates aboard other goalettes. Now they support another captain in this gigantic work of building between the village and the sea, a new goalette which will be the pride of the country. patience, the caulker applies his oakum. When he rolls his oakum for the decks, spring has found him at the foot of the capes, at the same spot where, at the beginning of autumn, he found the first shape of the goalette. and the carpenter survey the results of six months of vigilance and labor. They regard the ship not without some apprehension, for it is May 22nd, the eve of the launching. Already the goalette has become almost a home, and the captain's wife has added the final touches to the cabin. the preparations for the launching have begun. With heavy jacks, and yet with a great deal of gentleness, a goalette of more than 200 tons is raised from its throne on the beach. With great precaution, so that she will not escape them, the captains tilt her toward the sea. The launching bed is made of two rails of wood, which are called limonde, or flatfish, after a fish which has a slippery skin. The rails are coated generously with grease. On the flatfish are put wooden trolleys, called eels, because they too are slippery. Finally, the goalette rests on the eels, and the eels on the flatfish. And all these fish wait only for the sea, which will come to meet them at the hour of the full moon. is finished. A wooden ship, 
built almost in the way in which Noah must have built the ark. But this ship carries radar. for her to meet the rising sea. The sea insinuates itself, enveloping the flatfish and rising almost to the goalet, which waits for the touch of the water. But the evening tide is not as high as the morning tide, and there remains one night of waiting before the launching. of the full moon and the high tide, a team of workmen and carvers, of sailors and captains, rejoice at the coming of the new goalette to the sea. The carpenter and the captain have a great deal at stake. At dawn, the tide will be at its highest, and they will launch a goalette called the Jean Richard. By a tradition on the river, a new ship carries the name of the captain's son, who will be the next to sail, the next to go to sea. tonight. Like the wedding of a daughter, the village is celebrating the launching. Some leave the dance just before dawn to grease the skin of the flatfish and to watch the rising of the tide. They have built a ship which will sail the river as far as the Great Lakes to the west and the Strait of Belle Isle and the waters of Newfoundland to the east. finds itself on the shore at the appointed hour to witness the meeting of the sea and the ship.
built at Petite Riviere by Philippe Lavoie for Paul Emile Carré, captain of Port au Persil, has been launched on this 23rd day of May, ships of steel, and the carpenters and the captains say that perhaps for the last time a wooden goalette has been built and launched on the shores of the River St. Lawrence. This is a village below a cape, where a captain has used the form of a wild goose the strength of a mountain forest and the help of many captains to build a ship to sail the waters of St. Lawrence North. C'est sur le bord du Saint-Laurent, pip, enfin c'est l'amour, c'est l'amour, c'est sur le bord du Saint-Laurent, il y avait trois jolies filles, il y avait trois jolies filles, il y avait trois jolies filles, tarira la la ri la la, pip, enfin c'est l'amour, c'est l'amour, tarira la la ri la la, tarira la la ri la la. 